China's military accused a Philippine vessel of illegally entering waters near Scarborough Shoal without authorization and urged the Philippines to cease its provocations. The Scarborough Shoal is claimed by China, the Philippines, and Taiwan. Tensions between China and the Philippines in disputed waters of the South China Sea have increased, with recent allegations of a collision between a Chinese Coast Guard vessel and a Philippine boat. China claims sovereignty over a significant portion of the South China Sea, leading to maritime friction and territorial disputes with neighboring countries. The military spokesperson called on the Philippines to halt its actions, emphasizing the violation of China's sovereignty and international norms. China's Ministry of State Security announced a crackdown on weather stations with foreign links that are deemed to pose a threat to national security. The spy agency stated that hundreds of illegal meteorological facilities were sending information abroad, including from sensitive sites like military bases, industrial enterprises, and grain-producing areas. Some of these stations were allegedly directly funded by foreign governments, and data was said to be sent to overseas security officials. While the spy agency did not specify the nations involved, it stated that China's security officials are investigating and addressing the relevant illegal activities. This move indicates the increasing assertiveness of China's spy agency under President Xi Jinping, who has emphasized national security. Foreign embassies and research groups often gather weather data in China, a practice that has become more critical as the nation faces extreme weather events. China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs emphasized the need for China and the United States to have an objective understanding of each other's strategic intentions and to view competitive factors correctly in future exchanges. The statement was made in response to questions about China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi's recent remarks that the road to a meeting between the leaders of China and the U.S. in San Francisco would not be smooth. The ministry spokesperson highlighted the importance of abiding by the consensus of the two heads of state, stabilizing bilateral relations, and maintaining open channels of communication. Additionally, China and the U.S. have agreed to hold consultations on maritime affairs, as well as arms control and nonproliferation in the coming days. Chinese and Russian officials, including Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu, opened the Xiangshan Forum in Beijing, an international defense conference. Zhang Yoxia, one of China's senior military officials, warned that foreign forces were seeking to sow turmoil globally, accusing unnamed countries of deliberately creating chaos, interfering in regional issues, and instigating color revolutions. He also expressed China's willingness to improve military-to-military -military ties with the United States. Russia's Shoigu, speaking at the forum, warned that the West, after provoking a crisis in Europe, was trying to expand crisis potential in the Asia-Pacific region. He emphasized the risks of direct conflict between nuclear powers and criticized the West's approach towards Russia. The United States has initiated bulk purchases of Japanese seafood to supply its military in Japan in response to China's ban on such products after Tokyo released treated water from the Fukushima nuclear plant into the sea. U.S. Ambassador to Japan Rahm Emanuel revealed the initiative, emphasizing that Washington should consider broader measures to offset China's ban, which he views as part of economic wars. China Formerly the largest buyer of Japanese seafood, cited food safety concerns for its ban, while G7 trade ministers called for the immediate repeal of restrictions on Japanese food. The U.S. purchases will increase over time to include various seafood types, feeding soldiers in messes, on vessels, and sold in shops and restaurants on military bases. Taiwan's two major opposition parties, the Kuomintang KMT, and the Taiwan People's Party TPP, have agreed to collaborate in the upcoming parliamentary elections in January. However, they did not form a joint presidential ticket. The KMT's Eric Chu and TPP's Ko Wen Jie, a presidential candidate, met to discuss legislative elections, expressing their joint goal to secure over half of the seats to regain ruling power. While Vice President Lai Ching Te of the ruling Democratic Progressive Party, DPP, is the frontrunner in the presidential race, opposition supporters had hoped for a Koho UIH alliance to challenge the DPP's eight year rule. The joint statement from KMT and TPP emphasized the aim to restore peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait and initiate dialogue with China. Tensions between China and a powerful Myanmar armed group, the United Wa State Army, UWSA, are impacting the global tin supply chain. The UWSA's decision to suspend mining earlier this year, cutting off nearly a third of China's total tin or supply, has strained relations.
The situation is further complicated by Beijing's crackdown on cyber scam operations in the border region, as UWSA officials are targeted. The disruption may lead to higher tin prices in 2024, impacting the semiconductor industry, which relies on tin for electronic circuits. The expectation for Myanmar's mining to resume has now been pushed to Q1 2024. The U.S. Special Representative for North Korea, Sun Kim, held a video conference with China's Special Representative for Korean Peninsula Affairs, Liu Xiaoming. The talks focused on Washington's concerns about North Korea supplying arms to Russia and Beijing's potential forcible return of North Koreans within its territory. The U.S. has accused North Korea of supporting Russia in its invasion of Ukraine. With increased cooperation between Pyongyang and Moscow in 2023. Additionally, South Korea has pressured China to halt the forced repatriation of North Koreans. The discussions come ahead of an expected summit between U.S. President Joe Biden and Chinese leader Xi Jinping next month. Hamas has released a video showing three hostages seized on October 7, criticizing Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for failing to protect Israeli citizens during the attack and demanding a prisoner exchange for their release. The hostages include Yelena Trupanov, Danielle Aloni, and Ryman Kirsch. Netanyahu condemned the video as cruel psychological propaganda and pledged to make every effort to bring the hostages home. The video is the second message from hostages, following an earlier release featuring Franco-Israeli woman Mia Skem. The hostages' presence complicates the ongoing Israeli ground operation in Gaza. Professors from the University of California Ethnic Studies Faculty Council have demanded that the university retract its characterization of Hamas attack on Israeli civilians as terrorism, claiming that such language endangers students. The professors called for support of the Palestinian freedom struggle and accused the university's use of terms like terrorism and unprovoked of stoking anti-Muslim sentiments and making Palestinian students and community members unsafe. The university had previously condemned the horrific attack by Hamas on October 7 and referred to it as an act of terrorism. The professors argued that the university's communication distort and misrepresent the unfolding genocide of Palestinians in Gaza. The university has not responded to the demands. Canada's Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie has called for humanitarian pauses in Gaza amid the ongoing conflict between Israel and Hamas. Jolie urged all parties to agree to a truce to evacuate foreign nationals, release hostages, and allow the delivery of essential supplies. There are reportedly 400 Canadians trapped in Gaza. The minister emphasized the importance of protecting all civilians, both Israeli and Palestinian, and highlighted the need to adhere to international law during the crisis. Jolie mentioned that six Canadians have been confirmed dead in the conflict, and efforts are ongoing to locate two individuals who may be held hostage. Lebanon's caretaker Prime Minister, Najib Makati, is working to prevent the country from entering the Hamas-Israel conflict amid cross-border fire between Hezbollah and Israel. Makati, who fears an escalation, emphasized the need to avoid Lebanon being drawn into the war. He acknowledged the complex political situation in Lebanon, with the country being without a president for a year and facing economic challenges. Makati praised Hezbollah for managing the situation rationally but expressed concerns about the evolving circumstances and the potential for regional chaos. The ongoing border skirmishes have raised worries that Hezbollah, a Hamas ally, could open a new front with Israel. Israeli troops engaged in a clash with Hamas militants in Gaza, marking the first ground offensive involving the use of tunnels since the conflict began. The Israel Defense Forces, IDF, killed several terrorists spotted exiting a tunnel near the Erez crossing, leading Israel to believe they were attempting to cross into the country for a surprise attack. The clash occurred as part of Israel's intensified war with Gaza, involving ground operations aimed at destroying Hamas. Israel opted for a low-intensity ground offensive, stopping short of a full invasion. The move is seen as an effort to address concerns about hostages and threats from Hamas-linked Arab proxies. Analysts speculate that Israel's preference for a gradual expansion indicates a desire to negotiate the release of hostages. The ground assault has resulted in a near-total communications blackout in Gaza. Hamas reported that its militants in Gaza fired anti-tank missiles at Israel's invading forces, engaging in clashes with Israeli troops. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu rejected calls for a ceasefire, stating that such calls amount to asking Israel to surrender to terrorism.
Israel continued its ground operations, targeting Gaza's main north-south road and attacking Gaza City from two directions. Israeli forces also freed a soldier from Hamas captivity, one of 239 hostages captured on October 7. The Al-Qassam Brigades, Hamas armed wing, claimed that militants targeted Israeli forces invading the southern Gaza axis with machine guns and anti-tank missiles. The death toll in Gaza has risen to 8,306, with over 1.4 million civilians displaced. Calls for a ceasefire have intensified, with the UN and other countries urging a halt to fighting to allow humanitarian aid to reach Gaza. However, Israel remains determined to press ahead with its plans to eliminate Hamas. The military's slow progress in the ground offensive aims to keep open the possibility of negotiating the release of hostages held by Hamas. The humanitarian situation in Gaza continues to deteriorate, with a lack of fuel, food, and clean water. UNRWA reported that civil order has broken down, with people storming UN warehouses in search of food. The White House is working to get more aid trucks into Gaza, while international calls for a ceasefire persist. Jordan has reportedly requested the deployment of Patriot air defense systems from the United States to counter potential ballistic missile threats. The request comes amid rising tensions in the region, although the specific nature of the threats was not disclosed. Jordan does not host American bases, but a defense cooperation agreement signed in January 2021 allows the U.S. unimpeded access to certain Jordanian facilities for training and maintenance. Additionally, the Jordanian armed forces denied allegations that U.S. aircraft were using local air bases to supply Israel during the Israel-Hamas conflict, emphasizing Jordan's support for Palestine. The United States faces the risk of being drawn into a conflict with Iran amid repeated rocket and drone attacks on American troops in the Middle East. At least 14 attacks in Iraq and 9 in Syria since October 17 have been blamed on Iran-backed forces. The U.S. has conducted limited strikes on sites in Syria linked to Tehran, aiming to prevent a broader conflict. While Washington has stated its desire to avoid regional war, there are concerns about miscalculation and escalation. Iran attributes the attacks to wrong American policies, including support for Israel in the Israel-Hamas conflict. Russian President Vladimir Putin blamed the West, specifically the ruling elites of the U.S. and their satellites, for the crisis in the Middle East, including the conflict between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. He accused the West of seeking constant chaos in the region and discrediting countries advocating for an immediate ceasefire. Putin expressed Russia's support for an immediate ceasefire and a two-state solution in Gaza, emphasizing the need for a sovereign, independent Palestinian state. He linked Russia's actions in Ukraine to fighting against the forces he believes are responsible for the Middle East crisis. Putin also blamed the West and Ukraine for recent events in Dagestan, without providing evidence. An anti-Semitic telegram channel called Morning Dagestan, with around 65,000 subscribers incited a mob of protesters to ransack a Russian airport in search of Jews. The channel alerted followers to the arrival of a plane from Tel Aviv and instructed them to interrogate passengers they believed were Jewish. The crowd, numbering in the hundreds, stormed the airport, breaking through security cordons. The channel made desperate appeals for restraint as events escalated, urging followers to avoid vandalism and assault. The Russian Ministry of Internal Affairs identified 150 people involved in the rioting and detained 60. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called on Russia to take strong action against the rioters and anti-Semitic incitement. NATO's Strategic Communications Center of Excellence Director, Janis Sartz, stated that the recent riots at Makhachkala Airport in Russia's Dagestan were not beneficial to the Kremlin, despite being fueled by Russian propaganda inciting hatred. Sartz highlighted that Russian media is currently promoting hostility towards Ukrainians, the West, and Israel. He noted that tensions are rising in Russia, particularly in places like Dagestan, where many who died in Ukraine originated. Sartz emphasized that such manifestations of radicalization are not in the Kremlin's interest, and the government will likely attempt to suppress them using force. The recent anti-Semitic rally in Makhachkala saw participants storming the airport, resulting in injuries and the temporary closure of the airport. The Department of Defense, DOD, has announced its intention to pursue a modern variant of the B-61 nuclear gravity bomb, designated the B-61-13, seeking congressional approval and funding.
The B-61-13 is expected to be 24 times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima during World War II. The Pentagon emphasizes the changing security environment and growing threats from potential adversaries as reasons for pursuing this capability. The bomb, if approved, will replace some of the current B-61-7S in the U.S. nuclear stockpile without increasing the overall number of weapons. The DoD highlights the bomb's modern safety, security, and accuracy features, positioning it as a step to address challenges in the current security environment. The Ukrainian armed forces have reportedly conducted successful strikes on a key Russian air defense facility in occupied Crimea and eliminated an S-400 anti-aircraft missile system near Luhansk. The strikes are said to have utilized Atakum's ballistic missiles provided by the United States. These actions come as part of a series of operations by Ukraine in Crimea. Resulting in notable successes, including attacks on airfields in Luhansk and Berdyansk, destroying assets such as nine helicopters. The Ukrainian military has not issued an official statement regarding these missile launches. Ukrainian President Zelensky met with a bipartisan U.S. House of Representatives delegation, including Representatives James Hill, Mike Quigley, and Stephen Lynch. Discussions centered on the continued support for Ukraine from the United States and the importance of passing President Biden's proposal to fund U.S. military aid to both Israel and Ukraine. Zelensky briefed the delegation on the situation on the battlefield and the pressing needs of the Ukrainian military. The visit highlighted the unity of support for Ukraine from both the Republican and Democratic parties, the Biden administration, and both houses of the U.S. Congress. The White House had recently requested nearly $106 billion from Congress for Ukraine, Israel, and national security needs. German Defense Minister Boris Pistorius has stated that German residents should prepare for the possibility of war in Europe. He emphasized the need for Germany to be capable of self-defense in the face of evolving geopolitical challenges, influenced by conflicts in the Middle East and Russia's actions in Ukraine. Pistorius rejected accusations of slow government response. Citing the establishment of a 100 billion euro special fund for the Bundeswehr and organizational changes. While acknowledging the long neglect of the Bundeswehr, he expressed optimism about Germany's improved position by the end of the decade. Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu accused the West, particularly the US-led NATO alliance, of attempting to expand the conflict in Ukraine to the Asia-Pacific region. Speaking at China's Xiangshan Forum, Shoigu claimed that NATO was concealing military force buildup in the Asia-Pacific and trying to spread conflict potential to the region. He criticized NATO countries for fueling an Asian arms race and argued that security blocks like the Quad and AUKUS were undermining the role of ASEAN and nuclear nonproliferation efforts in Asia. Shoigu emphasized Russia's readiness for post-conflict talks on Ukraine but insisted that the West should stop seeking Russia's strategic defeat.